The summer of 47 was a pretty revolutionary year. It's like, you know, the summer of love only in the sky with strange things and everyone was seeing them. What's happening in the country is sightings of flying disks or objects in the sky on an almost daily basis throughout the entire summer of 1947. People were observing UFOs all across the country. Suddenly, it was a common subject of conversation. More and more people were involved in what soon became a controversy that went to the highest levels of government. The audience splits on Maury Island. Some people say it's a legitimate and uh, valid case, that solid evidence was collected. Other people say not so. Kenneth Arnold was the right guy at the right time to come forth and coalesce the idea uh, that this thing is not a joke, that these things are really happening. There were sightings of metallic disc-shaped aircraft flying over the city of Portland, Oregon. It made the headlines. One of the saucers uh, allegedly crashed outside of Roswell, New Mexico. They start hearing about this alien craft crashing, bodies involved, military cover-up. You've got UFO sightings going all over the United States and always comes back to Roswell. Out of the blue, we are thrown into the idea that, whoa, maybe our enemies are not going to be coming from our own planet. Maybe we've got people visiting us. And the Summer of the Saucers was just that. Everything seemed to break loose at that period of time. Ken Arnold is a very interesting figure in ufology, in my opinion, because he was the one who kicked it off, in a sense. It started on June 24th of 1947, when Kenneth Arnold was flying over Mount Rainier. He took off from Chehalis, Washington. He was headed for Yakima. And without warning, while he was flying in broad daylight in excellent weather, he encountered a formation of metallic crescent-shaped aircraft that he estimated were flying at about 1,200 miles an hour. And you have to remember that back then, there were no aircraft that flew at 1,200 miles an hour. It changed the way that we think about UFOs, and initially, it gave us one of the most long-lasting, and probably from the point of view of a UFO researcher, one of the most difficult phrases in the English language. Flying saucers. Flying saucers. Flying saucers. Flying saucers. Flying saucers. Have you wondered about those flying saucers? You are now inside a flying saucer. Two little men in a flying saucer. Kenneth Arnold landed his aircraft and the press jumped on it. And there was a reporter from the East Oregonian newspaper who had a face-to-face -face interview with Kenneth Arnold and said, Mr. Arnold, how did they fly? And he was kind of frustrated because he was trying to describe this what's been called a leaf fluttering motion of UFOs. They appeared to ride on some kind of current field, whatever. They don't fly the way that our planes do, planing through the air. It's a different kind of movement. He didn't describe them as saucers, by the way. He said, if you just took a saucer and skipped it over a lake or the water, it skipped like that, and that's what it looked like they flew like. And the newspaper reporter, of course, is rapidly jotting down notes, and he shortened it, and he wrote Flying Saucer. So he had no idea when he got up that morning that he was going to create a phrase that was gonna go into the English language and was gonna catch on like wildfire for good or ill everywhere. From then on, we were stuck with flying saucers.
cosa do seca We're in the valley in the shadow, actually, of Mount Rainier, which, of course, many of you know, was where the first sighting of the spaceships were. And it, this was by, um, oh, God, what? Kenneth Arnold. Yes, who said that? Kenneth Arnold, thank you. But yes, it was good old Kenneth Arnold. And he saw it, and he coined the term flying saucers because they looked like little plates flying around. Now, that was what started. Then something really weird happened back in the... It was the 80s, Walmart moved in. While they were building the roof on the Walmart, there was like this big torsion field. You know what a torsion field is? You know, when you look in the toilet and you see the, you know, it starts turning, the water turns a certain way. Torsion field. There was a torsion field that was over that right, like storm clouds, just brewing right above that. And it never happens. And then it opened up like a, like a, um, a funnel, like a, like, you know, these like bunt cakes. It was like this cloud got really fat and puffy. And then there was a hole in it right underneath. And many of the people, the citizens in this community saw that. And love is the answer, as the old Beatles would say. I mean, I consider myself a 60s survivor myself, making it through my military uh, commitment to our country and our world for all of us to have love, freedom, peace, happiness. Let it abide in our hearts and souls and bodies. Let it be manifested to everyone that positive energy can overcome any negativity our world offers us. Talking about what happened in Portland, Oregon over the July 4th weekend, that one really fascinates me because you can tell, first off, this is like many newspapers across the country, but the headline actually reads, you know, saucers over Portland, UFOs invade Portland. They actually use the word invade. It disrupted the city. There was clearly a disruption because it happened all day. It was because they saw things in the sky that move differently. They were doing things that were physically impossible. People are probably off work and enjoying the day off. Beautiful summer day. And all of a sudden, police officers, credible witnesses, harbor patrol officers are seeing basically disks at this point in uh, groups of two and three and five. They're describing UFOs in police language. They talk about a giant metallic hubcap in the sky. Now that, that would be a description you would expect from a policeman. If you saw something, you had no idea what it was, you'd liken it to something that you do know. So you call it a hubcap. They appeared to be metallic. They were flying. They were round. They did not have wings. They did not have jet engines, propellers, anything that would make them conventional. It's almost as if there was an invasion from Mars that day uh, that perpetuated the fear and the panic that was there with Orson Welles' 1938 broadcast of War of the Worlds. What you have to realize, flying was a very big deal in 1947. People dressed up for it, so it was, it was special. And so when planes flew over, they looked at planes. So a lot of the public was very aware of, of what planes were like. So these were things they saw that no one recognized what it was. It's a fundamental question of why the event isn't known, and particularly with UFO bus. You think they'd know more about it. Everybody's heard about Roswell, but a lot of people don't realize that Roswell happened at the same time as Portland. Roswell was the cover-up to the July 4th event. 
Now they have the explanation for this. This is the answer to the UFOs. It was a weather balloon. So now we don't have to talk about it. And it seems to have been suppressed over the years for some strange reason. It's almost as if in keeping with Portland's, you know, iconic moniker, keep Portland weird, maybe they have decided that this is something they need to keep in their own bailiwick. I don't know why, but it seems to be the highlight, basically, of the Summer of the Saucers. Came right before Roswell. Yes. It's like you're whoever played before Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. <laughs> no one's gonna remember who you are. There you go, perfect, you're exactly right. The opening act for the Stones, you know? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of... The Hi, it's me, UFO Phil, coming to you live, pre-recorded from my underground quarantine tent below Los Angeles with a little history lesson about the Roswell UFO incident. It was early July 1947 when a large object was reported to have crashed on a ranch just outside of Roswell, New Mexico. The Roswell Army Airfield initially reported that they had actually found flying saucer wreckage at the crash site. But can you keep a secret? They later changed their story to say it was merely a crashed weather balloon. The story disappeared for about 30 years until a great UFO researcher named Stanton Friedman came along and he resurrected the story. It was like church, yo! And he went around and he collected eyewitness accounts and revealed a conspiracy theory. Conspiring and, and like theorizing involving a crashed UFO, extraterrestrial bodies, and, and made a big crater. Alien autopsies, alien bodies, and of course, can you keep a secret? A United States government cover-up, but we didn't believe them. And this cemented the Roswell incident as the motherload UFO event in history. Okay, I think I'm ready to film one. When does the audience get here? There's no audience, Phil. Oh, really? Oh. Do you have any snacks? Some of those little goldfish crackers would be nice. Are we on yet? Why don't you go Hey, first? shut up, loud car. Get a muffler. We are here on 150... I don't no, know we're on 9th. We I'll do the street. <laughs> okay. He doesn't know, know where he is. 
We are here on 9th Avenue Southwest and Southwest 152nd in Old Burien in front of the Maury Island Incident Mural. Steve. This mural was commissioned by the executive producer of the Maury Island Incident film. And it's really an interesting piece of art that has become a permanent installation in the city of Burien. And it kind of wraps in all of the elements of the story of the Maury Island incident. On June 21, 1947, a man named Harold Dahl went out on his 50-foot boat out on Puget Sound in Washington. And he took two men that he hired off the docks in Tacoma and his son, so we have two men, and his son Charles, the family dog. <coughs> At the time, something dramatic happened. Scott, what happened? Well, as you can see up here, up in the sky, six disks appeared, about 100 feet in diameter, hollow in the center, and they came down. One of them appeared to be in trouble. One of the disks was having problems, maybe wobbling a little. And the one that was having trouble was right above the boat, maybe 500 feet. And it started to actually eject material. Hot molten slag that hit the dog and killed the dog. Ah! And then burned the son's arm. They got off the boat and according to the story, they hid in the cliffs uh, on that East Bay of Maury Island until the disks went away. And when they're gone, the party on the beach now goes back to the boat, gets the boat back in the water, climbs on, they go back to Tacoma. And at that moment, they say they're not gonna talk about it. They're not gonna tell anybody what they saw. It's, they don't really know what to do with this thing that has happened to them. So the next day, after Harold Dahl has this amazing incident happen to him, a man appears at his house on his porch. A man dressed in all black. What we would today see out of central casting for a Man in Black film or The X-Files, knocks on Harold Dahl's door and says, I need to talk to you about what you saw on the water yesterday. One of the most controversial aspects of the rise of the unidentified flying object are the reports of the men in black. There's something off about them. They don't quite appear human. They look like humans. They look like somebody who's made to pass for human, but perhaps they are not. Normally, uh, the appearance of a men in black are subsequent to a major sighting of some kind. Basically, they startle the witness and they remind the witness of what they saw that they could not explain and they impress upon them quite bluntly that this is something that they don't want to talk about. The thing about the Maury Island incident is as far as our research shows we think that's the first man in black sighting associated with a flying disc, flying saucer, UFO. According to the story Harold Dahl and this man in black go to a diner in Tacoma and at that meeting at the diner, the man in black proceeds to tell Harold Dahl everything that Harold Dahl saw on the water the day before. Just recounts it. And when he's done telling the story to Harold, he warns Harold, yes, you shouldn't tell anybody about what you saw on the water yesterday. And he actually issues a warning because bad things could happen. They could happen to you, they could happen to your family. What people don't know is that during the summer of 1947, we were just beginning the Cold War. We had just found a new enemy, and it was called the Soviet Union. They were worried if something was flying over the skies of the United States, it could be something that was created by a foreign power. And what made people the most nervous was it could be created by the Soviet Union. So what happened was they investigated the sightings aggressively. And how it relates to Maury Island is two Army intelligence officers Lieutenant Frank Brown and Captain William Davidson. They had been assigned to investigate some of the sightings in the Pacific Northwest. And they got a specific assignment to go to Tacoma and conduct interviews with Harold Dahl. They arrive on July 31st. They land at McCord Air Force Base. They're flying a B-25 bomber, of all things. So they land at McCord, they go to the Winthrop Hotel in uh, Tacoma, Washington, and uh, by the time they arrive, Harold Dahl is so nervous about everything that's happened and bad things have been happening to him that he no-shows at the interview. But Ken Arnold shows up 
a United Airline pilot named uh, E.J. Smith shows up, and also a man named Fred Chrisman, who became kind of a collaborator with Harold Dahl, shows up. So they have these conversations about what Dahl saw on Maury Island, and they actually are provided samples of the material that fell from the flying disks. So they take the samples of what fell off the flying disks, put it on the B-25, and they make it about 30 minutes into the flight, flying south. And the B-25 bomber spontaneously catches fire. And the plane crashes east of Kelso, Washington in a very dense forest, and the pilots perish in the crash. Harold Dahl, uh, by this point, was absolutely devastated, uh, embarrassed, uh, wishing none of this had ever happened to him. And he starts to say, I'm going to tell the world if I'm asked that I made it all up. Now it's very interesting because if you really study this and you look at the documentation from the subsequent investigations, he is extremely consistent with his verbiage. He never once says, I made the Maury Island incident story up. He never says anything like that. It is always couched in terms of, if I'm asked, I'm going to tell the world that I made this story up because I would rather be tainted with an allegation of a hoax. I would rather have that than the kind of ridicule I'm suffering as a result of saying I saw something. The FBI begins investigating the B-25 crash and at the end of the investigation, there are two major reports that are created by the FBI field officer in charge, um, a special agent named Jack Wilcox. They're both sent directly to J. Edgar Hoover. Harold Dahl does exactly what he said he would do. As he's investigated, as he gives interviews, he tells Jack Wilcox and other FBI agents this. I really saw what I saw. I'm not making it up. But I'm now going to tell you that I've made it all up and I'm the biggest liar that ever lived. That's actually a quote out of the FBI investigative files. I'm now going to claim that I'm the biggest liar that ever lived because I need to make this go away from me. Burning Saucer is uh, the annual business meeting of the Maury Island Incident Historical Society. What we do at this annual meeting is we tell the tale, we remind all in the community uh, everything that happened at the Maury Island Incident, the entire story. The man in black, the tragedies that followed, the entire, the entire story. But we also conduct the business of the Historical Society, which has become bigger and better, and we're able to do things like send emissaries out into the world to, to shape it uh, in a more uh, historically accurate fashion. But the event ends in a, a really wonderful ceremony, burning saucer, and every year we have an artist resident who creates a saucer, which is secret, which is not revealed until five minutes before it must burn. It is revealed, there is a monologue explaining why we have that saucer. It is shown to the audience, and then we burn it. How long did you spend building this, Terry? A year? We feel that our story has been suppressed and continues to be suppressed by Roswell. Roswell, New Mexico, Roswell, the city, Roswell, the sighting, has sort of sucked the oxygen out of the room in terms of the creation of the modern UFO era. Two years ago, at one of our burning saucer celebrations, we commissioned Pacific North Weird on a journey to Roswell, 
New Mexico to basically deliver a message. And the message was, we're first, we're important, and we're on the same playing field. So we gave them three things. We gave them a necklace, and that necklace had six discs on it, each disc representing one of the flying saucers that were sighted at the Moria Island incident. We also gave them a lanyard, a lanyard to wear around the neck that had the Maury Island incident movie poster on it signifying Maury Island incident, that these are our emissaries going to Roswell, New Mexico. And the final, the final object was an actual resolution from the state of Washington legislature from the Senate, a unanimous resolution naming uh, the Maury Island incident as the first significant UFO sighting in the modern era, which we thought would be of great interest to Roswell, since they like to act like they're first, and they're not. And with those three objects, we hope they could go uh, send a message to Roswell. Business, petitions, memorials, and Senate resolutions. Senate floor resolution 8648, the Secretary will read. Whereas on June 21st, 1947, Tacoma resident Harold Dahl and his son allegedly sighted six flying discs over Puget Sound near Vashon, Murray Island, an event now commonly known as the Murray Island Incident. And whereas on June 22nd, 1947, Mr. Dahl alleges he was warned not to talk about what he saw by a man dressed in a black suit. And whereas on June 24th, 1947, pilot Kenneth Arnold alleges he saw nine unidentified flying objects near Mount Rainier. And whereas these controversial sightings helped launch a pop culture phenomenon of UFO sightings across the United States during the summer of 1947, which became known as the Summer of the Saucers. And whereas on August 8th, 1947, two weeks after the Washington sightings, a UFO is alleged to have crashed outside Roswell, New Mexico, and this alleged crash has since become the most well-known alleged UFO incident in history. It's one thing to talk about things like going to another city and taking it on, their commercial exploitation of a story and taking it on. It's another thing to do it. Fuck this place, man. They stole my Leatherman here. I was 10 years old when the Roswell crash occurred, and I remember being terrified. I thought there were spacemen going to come and get everybody, that they were going to take over the world, and it just scared me to death. It's almost as if this was the beginning of the baby boomers' consciousness at that point. They have grown up with the idea of UFOs and flying saucers and potential life on Mars. Hollywood did not miss a trick, and science fiction movies were now all about aliens coming to Earth. We are the Mysterians. Our race is old, dying, our planet dead. Only you of Earth, you and your women, can give us life. And what we want, we take. You know, I think what scared me so bad about that particular thing, I'd been a Superman fan, and back in those days, there were 15-minute segments every afternoon of Superman, and so I, I knew there was somebody from outer space, and I wasn't sure they were good. I can't even tell you how many ufologists who are in my age category 
if you ask them about the most important movie they ever saw about UFOs, they will tell you The Day the Earth Stood Still, 1951, Michael Rennie, Sam Jaffe, and the giant silver robot that comes out of the UFO that lands in the baseball park in Washington, D.C. It has spawned a great, huge industry. You have UFO conventions, you have the film industry, you have film franchises, Men in Black, you got this uh, Spielberg guy that likes flying saucers, you got all sorts of filmmakers. So I'm thankful as an artist that that exists and I hope to capitalize on Maury Island incident to its fullest extent, fullest extent. The first thing that happens when you start thinking about extraterrestrial visitors to the Earth, that goes right along with you learning more about astronomy, for instance. You learn that the Earth is not the center of the universe, that we are basically a small grain of sand on the shore of a nearly infinite cosmic beach, and we have no idea how many stars there are out there, how many habitable worlds there are, or how much life there might be. Our whole perspective of the cosmos has changed. This inevitably makes you more philosophical. We are dealing with the most important scientific question that has ever confronted mankind. Namely, are we alone in this galaxy or are we not? My father really found his element here. This makes him very happy. And that's what this whole festival is about, is bringing together all beings in a place of love and fun. Because no matter what anyone thinks, when we all listen, we know that we are all connected. I can't think of a bigger game changer than studying UFOs for altering the way that you see yourself and the way that you see the universe. And that's one of the reasons that I still love it. And you have a tendency to do this when you get older, is to look back and you kind of rewrite history in your own mind and how it was. And you reminisce about the idea that the summer of the saucers was important. It was something you lived through, like the nuclear scare, uh, like Woodstock or anything like that. The social ideas of the time come back to you in your older age and you realize that that was a time that started it all and you were there.